Well, our lesson this morning is I'm going to begin us. I, I, my task is kind of to serve as bookends. So I, I not only, you know, every year try to be the MC and introduce everything and handle the logistical matters, but uh, introduce us to the subject matter and then get our, our, our minds primed uh, and so that we are prepared to deal with the matters ahead. So Lane and Jeff will be lecturing today, but I wanted to offer uh, an introduction here for the next uh, several minutes on a title that uh, we have here, He Condemned Sin in the Flesh, The Law and Union with Christ in Romans 7, 14, 8, 3, and Galatians 2, 20. And again, our conference theme is the law is spiritual, which is a phrase that comes from Romans 7, 14. And that's a verse that has been a perennial challenge for interpreters. Because the question is, what does it mean for the law to be spiritual? Now, certainly in the few minutes that we have allotted here for the, the bookends to these addresses, I'm, I'm not going to be able to come anywhere close to a complete treatment, even if all I was trying to do was offer a description of all the various views that are out there on that particular phrase. And much less am I able to uh, develop a compelling case for a nuanced view from a redemptive historical perspective. So my intention is, is then to offer at least some exegetical and hermeneutical and biblical theological suggestions for approaching this difficult verse and its immediate context, namely in Romans chapter 7. Now again, this is a caveat. This is not a fully developed case, but what I'm seeking to offer is a, a blueprint or a sketch of what could be developed in full course. And so as you interact with the material throughout the entire day, as, as Jeff speaks and Lane speaks, uh, you could take this as something of a frame. You know, when you're building a house, you frame the house out, but then you go and you finish it. You, you add the drywall, you uh, mud it, you tape it, you, you paint it and finish the rooms. What we have here uh, in the next few minutes, I hope, will get us some categories, some ways of thinking to help us to approach the subject of the law being spiritual in a new and, and I hope, refreshing way. Now, of course, there's a typological and an eschatological difference among the people of God after Pentecost. Now, God delivered the Holy Spirit. He sent his Spirit unto us, and it is a turning point, a change. There's a difference before and after. And this is a fundamental point, I think, of Paul's epistle to the Galatians. Because after preaching Galatians myself, I kind of felt my understanding of Romans really open up. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. But I think there's a deep congruence between Galatians' structure and that of Romans. Not just that they're, of course, biblical inspired books and that God is speaking to us through both of them. But at least to me, it seems as if Romans is something of an amplified Galatians. When you look at the, the subject matters and the way that Paul addresses the argument and develops it, it seems to, to follow hand in glove between Romans and Galatians. You might even say uh, to, uh, to allude to a Spinal Tap that this that Romans is Galatians cranked up to 11. So it's interesting then to compare the flow of Paul's argument in Galatians with that of Romans because if that hypothesis is true, you should be able to look to one letter for assistance when the other letter is partific, uh, particularly difficult to understand in one part. And we always recognize the analogia fide, the analogy of faith, as scripture interprets scripture. But if we have two books that are really somewhat in lockstep, if one is a bit more difficult in one place, the other might add some light because it speaks from a different vantage point with different words. Much like Ephesians and Colossians are very, very similar. Sometimes you can look at one and get an added dimension and perspective to the other. I think Romans 7 is one of those chapters, uh, particularly with regard to the so-called schizophrenic eye. That's a phrase that uh, you can find in Dennis Johnson's chapter in Resurrection and Eschatology, Essays in Honor of Richard B. Gaffin, Jr. The question is, Paul is speaking in Romans 7 using a first-person singular pronoun, but what does he mean? To whom is he referring? He says, I, he says, myself, but, but how are we to understand that? Well, the ancient church held the view that Paul was referring to himself when he was an unbeliever. So when he says, I myself, he's talking about his pre-Christian experience. 
The Augustinian and Reformational tradition viewed it as the struggle of a believer that is battling with indwelling sin in this age. So Paul is saved, but he struggles with indwelling sin, and that's the battle that he describes in Romans 7. Yet others have argued for a redemptive historical view that Paul, more or less, is describing life under the Old Covenant. So in that regard, it's not first and foremost about regeneration, but it's about what life is like uh, prior to the coming of the New Covenant and the giving of the Holy Spirit. So I'd like for us, on that front, to consider the hypothesis that Romans 7, 14a, the first part, the law is spiritual, that that phrase is explained in part by Galatians 3, 19, and that Galatians 3, 22 through 24, in turn sheds light on Romans 7.14b. That's the hypothesis for this morning. And if that is the case, then the struggle of Romans 7 is that of the earthly or the dust man, koikos, from 1 Corinthians 15.47-48. And the point would be, this is the whole point in, in, uh, in summary form, that the law is given as a word from heaven. The law originates from heaven, And it guides us as God's people as a pedagogue unto the precipice. It leads us unto the heavenly realm, unto the promised land, just as Moses, as a mediator, brought the people up out of Egypt under God's hand and led them through the wilderness up to the Jordan, up to the precipice. Moses did not pass in. So also the law analogously comes from heaven. It's a word of God to lead us and guide us and draw us unto where we are to go, to ascend the mountain of the Lord. But there's a problem, of course, because to cross over into the promised land, we need a new power, a new mode of existence. We need something more than a man of the earth. We need the man of heaven. We need life giving spirit, which is exactly what Christ has become for us through the power of his resurrection. And once we are there and once the man of heaven enters in, he crosses the the proverbial Jordan River. He enters into the highest heavens through his own blood, through his own obedience. He gives to us his spirit so that we then may offer an obedience of faith. Romans 1.5 which was the goal of the law in the first place, Romans 8, 4. So to understand this, we need to understand some big picture things. We need to understand the bi-covenantal context of the covenant of works, the covenant of grace. We need to understand what it means to be united to a federal head. For all have died in Adam, right? We have died in him. We were represented by Adam, all who descend from him by ordinary generation. But we have a Redeemer now, and we are united to Christ in the covenant of grace. This structure is so critical. And we speak a lot about union with Christ in the Reformed tradition, and especially here at Reformed Forum. But often when we speak of it, I I imagine many of us, our minds move towards what are called ordo salutis concerns. When we think of union with Christ, we might think of our connection to the federal head and what we get from him. So from Adam, we have the imputation of his sin. You know, the want of original righteousness. We have guilt, condemnation, death. But from Christ, we have benefits such as his full righteousness. We have justification, adoption, sanctification. All those things are true. All those things are absolutely important. But I want to add a little dimension of our consideration here, to our consideration. And I want us to think not just about the things we receive, from our union with the federal head, but think about our identity. I want us to go deeper even because this will help us understand Paul's use of the law and the spirit. We need to understand that we are belonging to an age, either this age or the age to come. That we either are in Adam, we are dead, we are dusty, earthly people, or we belong to Christ who's not of this world who brings his people out of that age into the age to come, where we are seated with him even in heavenly places, where we have a different type of life. This is established clearly in 1 Corinthians 15 as Paul contrasts the natural and the spiritual. 
One of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible, especially starting at verse 35. There are two modes of existence, Paul is saying. There are two eons, two ages. And Christ does not allow us to improve our lives merely, but he brings us into an eschatological age. He transplants us better. He translates us into a new age that we would live a life of a higher, more glorious order. In Christ, we have an entirely new identity. We're no longer citizens of this world of this age, but citizens of heaven. Of course, Adam and Christ are compared and contrasted throughout the Bible. Christ is the greater, and he is the second and last Adam. But we see this federal headship established in other places leading up to Romans 7. You think of Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21, where we are described as being in Adam, where his sin is imputed to all who descend from him by ordinary generation. We're dead in sins, even prior to having committed any personal sin. Yet all is not lost. Because we have died to sin, and we have now Christ's righteousness. Adam's sin is imputed to us, but when we believe in Jesus Christ, by grace, through faith, our sins are imputed to him, and he dies to pay the penalty for our sins. And his full righteousness, his active and passive obedience, is imputed to us, so that when we stand before the Lord, we are holy and righteous and beyond condemnation, for we have been justified, and more than that, adopted and sanctified. Romans 5 is critical. And 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 49 is critical, foundational to this basic understanding. But I also want to add to that now as we move closer to Romans 7, 14, an illustration that Paul uses in Romans 7, verses 1 through 6. For there he brings up a new metaphor, the metaphor of a marriage, where Paul describes our marriage, our relationship to the law as a relationship a wife may have to her husband. He speaks in categories saying you are bound, you are, you are united, but if one party dies, then you are freed from that, from that bond. In the sense that if you're married and your spouse passes away, you are, you are free to marry another in the Lord. But even more than that, if we look at the biblical teaching of marriage, there certainly is a typological character. The institution of marriage is itself a type of Christ's relationship to his bride, the church. And even more so, think of this. Marriage is a significant, a very important, and a godly institution, yet in its essence it is provisional and it is preparatory because we are neither married nor given in marriage in the age to come. The institution does not persist into the eschaton, but it serves a very godly purpose to prepare us for the age to come. You see, the transfer and the transformation from this age to the age to come involves a death, as Paul alludes to in Romans 7, 1 through 6. But more than that, it also involves coming to life a death to sin, and coming alive to God. So one of the most powerful passages that speaks of this transfer is Galatians 2, 17 through 21, which explains the Christian mode of life, which is living by faith in Christ. Clearly, throughout the Bible, the the basic teaching is that salvation comes through Jesus Christ. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, we all must be saved by him, by grace through faith in the Messiah. And justification does not come by works of the law. Not at all. For no one will be justified by the works of the law. But the good news is that we have a loving Savior, one who gave himself for us. And Paul says in Galatians 2.20, probably my favorite verse, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm going to develop that more uh, in our conclusion today. But you may know that verse. I hope many of you have it memorized. And it's easy to read that verse or to recite it and think about what Christ has done for us and now that now we 
live through the power that he gives to us through faith. But we might not think about the depths to which Christ descended in his death and why he died. And to think about the role of the law in that verse. I have been crucified with Christ. Why? A death needed to occur. I am a sinner, and I should die for my sins. You should too. But praise be to God, we have a Savior who died for us. So when Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, what's he talking about? He says, the law has no power over me. What does the law do when it comes into contact with sinners? It shows them their sin and it condemns them. And it cries out, they must die. Just as the blood of Abel cried out from the ground against his brother Cain. The Lord knew that Abel's blood testified and it cried out that Cain must die. So too must we die for our sins. But Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So that when the law accuses, or when the enemy, when Satan comes and says, you are a guilty sinner, you must die, because you cannot stand before the face of a holy God. What's the response for people who live by faith? The proper response, according to Galatians 2.20, is, Yes, I must die, and I already did. I died to sin. I died to the law because Christ died on the cross for me. And I was there with him, united to him, by grace through faith in the Spirit. That is the entire Christian life. That we're identified to the one who died on the cross, who remained in the grave and then was raised from the dead, and now has ascended into heaven. He has ascended the mountain of God for us. The entire Christian life is about being in him, that we must be who we are in Jesus Christ because he died for us that we would live in him. And in Christ, you, of course, have died to sin and been made alive unto God. I want to look at a few verses here just again to set the table and get, our, get us thinking in uh, proper categories so that we are prepared to hear some of the lectures to come. And first uh, verse, as we consider the idea of being dead to sin, is Galatians 3.17. Now again, we're going to Galatians a lot because uh, my hypothesis is that it is helping to explain Romans 7. And the law is spiritual. But Galatians 3.17, there are Bibles in your seats, we're in a church, so if you uh, <laughs> want to grab one, that's fine. Paul says, uh, but if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not, he says emphatically. Certainly not. But what's the idea here? If salvation is by grace through faith and not by works of the law, if Jews must be saved in the same way as Gentile sinners, then the question is, does not Christ lead us into sin? Well, the problem with this question and this way of thinking it lies in the Judaizer logic. Because all men are sinners, and the law demonstrates that very point. But the good news is that through Christ, you have died to the law. Verse 19, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. Then verse 20a, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So the big point is that we must not live in sin. Don't live in sin, for you died to it. Where do we find that teaching? Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Do you hear Galatians 2.20? It's the same idea. We died on the cross, and now we're alive with him. The life which we now live, we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Paul continues, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, 
so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. The one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Why? He satisfied the law fully. Paul says, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Again, we need to consider our fundamental identity and that if you are in Christ, if you believe in him, you do not belong to this age. You're not under law. You are in and members of the age to come in Christ and you have the spirit. Again, it's a new mode of existence. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. But what does that life look like? Well, Paul explains that dynamic throughout his letters. But one place he says in Colossians 3 that we need to set our minds where it belongs. We need to think about the heavenly things because our life is with, is with Christ. We must not fixate upon the things of this world because we don't operate according to this mode of existence. We live with Christ in the heavenly places. And if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Think of the ages. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And in these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Brothers and sisters, you have a life hidden away with Christ in God. And you have been given now also new clothes. So put off the old and put on the new, as Paul says in Ephesians 4. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, the new man, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. What does that look like? Well, if you want to see your future what your life is now, but what it also will be in the consummation, we must look to Christ. Just to finish up our, our morning here, this intro, we need to look at 1 Corinthians 15. For the future bodily resurrection is the outward and the consummate revelation of what is already true for you who believe in the inner man. Verse 40, Paul says, There are heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. Think of that. 
It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. Again, looking at verse 47, think of this in light of Romans 7.14. Think of what this means for Romans 7.14 to say that the law is spiritual, but I am fleshly sold under sin. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The word there is koikos, earthly, dust man. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Brothers and sisters, live your life in the man of heaven according to his mode of existence, for that is who you are in him. Be who you are in Christ. But how then are we to live that kind of life? And what is the role of the Holy Spirit in all of this? And what is the relationship of the law in conjunction with the activity of the Holy Spirit? Well, we'll come back to that question. We will come back to that at the end of our sessions and consider the law's function in relation to the promised Holy Spirit.